Welcome to another edition of Quarantine Coaching Conversations. I'm Coach Gene Clemens. Thank you for joining us. I know that the climate right now is crazy, and our prayers go out to everyone out there um, that feel a need to reach out, the ones that are in trouble, the ones that are in pain. Understand that, that we see you. Understand that we stand with you in many cases, especially in my case. Um, I, I, I grieve. And, and I'm in pain, but we want to always be trying to point towards the good. And so with that, I am overjoyed to be able to, um, to, to introduce Coach David Barr. He's a um, coach that I have worked with. I worked underneath. I had a pleasure to work underneath. I learned a lot from. I think we had a great exchange of ideas. Um, and, and, and a guy who I think is just a – 100% quality guy first, and, and one heck of a football coach. And so I um, really want to thank you for joining us today, Coach Ball. Why don't you just tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, first off, thanks for having me, Gene. Uh, like we talked about before this, it's been too long since we've uh, gotten to see each other face to face, but this is an awesome opportunity to, to talk and share and some fellowship with each other. Um, just to give some background on myself, uh, most of first and foremost, uh, my wife and I have been married for four years. My wife, Susan, we live in uh, Mount Laurel, New Jersey. Uh, even though I work uh, and coach just outside of Philadelphia, uh, for people that aren't familiar, people that are probably where you are, think of Philadelphia and Jersey as two totally different stratospheres. It's we're just separated by a bridge. It's yeah, absolutely. Better. So, um, and uh, my wife is the greatest support system that I have. She's an amazing mother, an amazing wife, really blessed uh, for our relationship. And then we have two uh, amazing children. My daughter, Hannah, is uh, four years old. She, uh, she was the greatest blessing that I could have ever imagined coming into my life. You know, like you think you have life figured out and then you have children and you realize how much you didn't know before and how much you was missing from your life she's filled every one of those gaps she's the greatest gift i could ever imagine having and uh that's not the short end my son my son is uh just about a year and a half old uh, obviously i love him to death as well um but i think anyone that sees this especially that's a dad the your your baby girl does something to you that you can't you really put words to um so those two are are the are the best um, and I've been blessed with an awesome family off of that. I have two amazing sisters who've married two great guys. They each have two amazing kids. I have four nieces and nephews that are incredible. My parents have been a huge blessing in my life. Um, I got into uh, coaching right out of uh, playing college football. I played at Albright College, which is a Division three school in Reading, Pennsylvania. Um, loved every single second of it. And I think like most people, well, I shouldn't say that. That was a poor generalization. A, a lot of athletes, when they see that their playing career is over, there's like this void of, uh-oh, like, how am I going to fill this? And I definitely felt that. The second my last game was over, I felt it right away. And I knew I wasn't going to be able to keep playing. So I got into coaching, I think at first, because I needed that connection to, to a team and to feel that camaraderie with your with your guys like I needed that that connection and coaching was the best option for it so I think that's why I got into it at first um and then through my first three years I could probably say that that feeling was the driving force behind me staying in it and then uh I think a lot of coaches can probably attest to the same thing then it became the drive to try to climb the ladder a little bit and move up in position and gain some more responsibility. So then the focus became on just accumulating as much information and experience as possible. So I was working every camp I could, reading every book I could, watching every DVD, doing the whole thing, just almost obsessing over trying to, to just have the, as much access to as much information as I could. Um, and then I felt my career, my career focus, the, the, the incentive behind what I was doing totally changed. Uh, once I became a defensive coordinator, once I became a coordinator and w went to Urbana, uh, my shift totally changed to, 
uh, obsessing over developing the kids as young men. It wasn't ever, it, it, it moved from the football dynamic of it and the, and the team focus to, all right, I need to develop these guys as individuals and make sure that I'm pouring myself into them so that they can be, pour themselves into their families, their careers, their communities, and become the people that we, uh, that we need in this world. So I think it's almost kind of like becoming a dad, like you, before you're married or before you have kids, you, some of some people might be so career focused and so career driven, but then once you have, once you have kids, your focus totally changes. So that was definitely the case. Um, and now that's why I coach, I coach to, um, to be a, a resource for the kids to hopefully be a mentor and someone that they can maybe even model themselves after with certain aspects of their life and to just to try to give them an example and to give them a template of what they can be and to make sure that they know that any dream or aspiration that they have, it's not out of reach for them. And uh, I, I worked at Urbana for, um, for four years. I loved every second of it. And then uh, God's path led me to uh, back towards this way. And I've been coaching in high school since 2012. Um, I recently accepted a head coaching job at Upper Darby High School, which is uh, right next to the school that I've been teaching at uh, the last six years. So I'm super excited for the opportunity. The kids have been amazing to this point, especially since most of our time together has been over a computer uh, since we got sent home right around a month after I took the position. So um, my journey's taken me to some amazing places and just brought me uh, to so many amazing people that I've learned so much from. Um, I love, uh, I'm just so grateful for the platform that this this line of, uh, I, I can't even call it work, but this opportunity that football presents that it's given me, it's been such a blessing. Absolutely. And I, I know for me, I think about that, and, and I think everybody in coaching eventually comes to a crossroads where you make a decision about what your aim is in the, in the profession. Right. Um, and, you know, for some it's, you know, I want to attain the highest level. And for some is, I want to be somewhere comfortable. And, and it doesn't really matter the level. I just want to get somewhere comfortable. Right. I know for you and, and for, for myself, it became, I want to make sure that people are better equipped right. to deal with. And, and, and what, a, what, a, what a, a concept right now when we look at the, our society and what's going on in our country right now how many of our young men are equipped to be able to handle the situations and the pressures to know the difference between, you know, a, a, a meaningless demonstration versus a carefully crafted demonstration that, that has, a, has a clearly defined end yeah. and, and how to use their, their platform and their selves and when What's, what's worth putting your life on danger for and what's not worth putting your life on danger for? All, yeah. all lessons that you learn um, and that as a football coach, we get an opportunity to teach our young men about. Um, yeah. Three I words. Want, I don't want to cut you off. I, I Go want ahead. To, but real quick, to add to that, I hope that you feel good um, and I hope coaches everywhere that see this feel good about the impact that they make in direct relation to what our world is seeing right now, because I've spoken to multiple players uh, Saturday, Sunday, yesterday, today, that you and I coach together. And Absolutely. to hear uh, the strength and the conviction in their voices is a testament to what you've done, to what we did there as a staff, to what their other coaches, to what their parents, their teachers did for them. Um, I hope that the coaches and teachers and parents and mentors across the world, like they don't, they don't lose hope in this and that it's their voices, it's their actions that are shaping and building these, the younger generation that are hopefully going to take our, our society to where it needs to go. Cause there needs to be change. There needs to be differences without Absolutely. question. Absolutely. I think, I, I think the thing that doesn't get lost on me is that, Athletes lead the way mm -hmm. 
when it comes to this stuff. It's been that way since forever. When yeah. it, we talk about um, unity and harmony, and I and I, I sometimes thought with the idea that the locker room is the perfect place. We know it's not. We know that in the locker room, there's division sure. in the locker room, yeah. but there's respect in the locker room. Yep. You know, so while there, it may not be harmony in the locker room, there's respect for what each other brings to the yeah. table and what they, what they can do. And I, and I think that uh, it starts with respect. I can't take credit for this type of verbiage, but um, I, I recently heard someone say that, uh, similar to what you just said, like the locker room, it's imperfect, but at, but the locker room leads to the huddle and the huddle is a little bit more perfect. It's not perfect, but it's a little bit better, right? Because the, in the locker room, you're going to have those differences. There's a, there's a sense of togetherness. There's a sense of unity and it's just us, but, uh, but there's still different, like there's the differences still exist mm -hmm. when you're in the huddle though. And everyone's laid down the same sacrifice to get there. And you've, you've all sweated the same. You've all bled the same. You've, you've, you've invested the same as the guy next to you. When you're in the huddle, you're never looking at the guy next to you and be like, is he black? Is he white? Is he Muslim? Is he Christian? Like it's Absolutely. Hey, like we, if, if we don't count on each other here, this isn't going to work. It's not going to work. Not the big picture. Just I mean, the next play, like just coming out of this huddle, this yep. individual huddle, it's not going to work. And I think that picture of it, um, is, is awesome. And I know that the game did that for me. I know it continues to do it for me. I hope a lot of the players across the world feel the same way. And it's in the same thing in every sport, you know, the, the, the dynamic of sport provides the, the platform to, to unite and to see past, um, what might be preconceived differences with each other and see how we're the same. And hopefully more people can, can continue to do that and um again it's not to say that it's perfect i know it's not i know the game of football is not perfect and i know the structures of football at all levels not is not perfect just like all of us but uh it does reflect a lot of good and, and gives an awesome opportunity for so many of these kids to experience each other because in the conversations i have with a lot of guys that we coached the last couple of days they they kept reflecting back on how grateful they were especially when they got to college of the diversity of their team and to be able to, you know, like one of one of the guys that we both coach said, you know, coach, I never, I never really ate at a white family's house until I got to college and I went home with them for Thanksgiving. Like, it's awesome, right? Like that opportunity yeah. to share it and see that, like, it's just, it's it's cool to see it. And then vice versa, like, so many white players might not have ever had that type of experience at a black player's house or a Muslim with a Christian and same type of thing. Like it presents those opportunities that we don't always take advantage of, unfortunately, but um, they're there and hopefully more guys will, will keep seeing them. Absolutely. Absolutely. Three, three words um, that I want to focus on. Um, I believe these are three words from you. Lead, teach, develop. I know that that's a bedrock of what you believe in. No um, just just speak to us a little about it because I know, you know, I know how I feel about those three words. Just tell us about why those three words are so important to you. Yeah, well, the lead aspect, I think, um, I think some people are are <laughs> facing some hard truths with that word right now because you see, like, when leadership's not when it's not it. When it's not there, it's really evident. When it's mm -hmm. lacking, it's evident. And we're seeing that, uh, I don't wanna take this in a certain route, but we're seeing that in our country right now. The, the lack of leadership at a lot of different spots, uh, it sticks out. So I think what I've definitely learned from the, the experience that coaching has given me is that leadership needs to be exemplified. It's not necessarily because you might be led by my words. Someone else might be led by uh, the draw, the X's and O's drawings that I can put on the screen. Everyone's going to be led and motivated differently, but they're all going to be looking for that example. And to me, that's what leadership is. It's it's the example that you can set in every single setting, right? So I have a lot of different platforms. I can I can set the example as a father, as a husband, as a friend, as a coach, 
uh, as a community member, as a worshiper in my church, as a charitable person, like those examples of leadership, of being willing to be out front are important. And I think sports in general really, they, they bring that out of individuals of, okay, who can, who wants to be up front? Who wants to be the example? And, and the, those that aren't ready, that's okay. But you need to make sure that we're, you're modeling yourself in a way that's going to bring them to them. The teaching dynamic is, is the part of my life that I love the most. Like football, it's not, I, I, I don't, I don't like it when people get too technical over words, but it, it's not, I don't coach football. It's, it's a teach, it, you teach it, right? Like it's, it, you're, it's like teaching a class and it's like teaching your kids. And, and it's about, it's about setting a, a standard and then holding people to rise to that standard and trying to get them to exceed it. And I talk to my guys all the time about, and, and the girls that I teach about finding people in your life, in all aspects of your life, that will hold you to that standard. Because it's so easy to find the teacher or the coach that's gonna let you cut the corners. And the worst, the worst thing is when those people look you in the eye and say, I want what's best for you, but I'm gonna let you slide with this, I'm gonna let you go with this. And, and then you don't really grow, you don't really develop, you never find out what you're capable of accomplishing. The teaching aspect is, okay, here's the standard, here's the expectation but also here's how you meet it. It's not just show them what the expectation is. You have to show them how to get there, like how to achieve it. And I think that's a, a step that I see all of us miss at times is sometimes you get so focused then on the standard, but you don't show them how to get there. Sometimes we just assume that they know um, and that that's not the case. Um, and it, the, the, those dynamics together, I think, are what make it's what our world is thirsty for right we're thirsty for leadership and we're thirsty for teachers we're not in the classroom sense but people that are willing to teach people that are willing to say okay here's the standard and here's how you go do it right and and here's what i need from you so i think those are those are really important remind me again gina of your third word that you gave me develop develop so like i i hope you can feel the same way like there's not there's no greater feeling than being quote unquote handed a player and then you look at them four years later and you're like wow like how awesome that change that development was um and that's and that's operating with an end picture in mind right of of okay here's what here's like the must-haves that i want all of my players to have i want them you know to be to to have empathy, to work for equity, to fight for each other, to be good men, uh, to be good sons and brothers. And then those, those are things that you develop with everybody. And then you know that you have some guys that you can develop a little bit further and then some guys that are here, but it's that process of seeing them grow and mature. That's, that's really the most rewarding part is seeing, it's never an end product, but seeing when you're ready to then pass them on to their next stage, it's that reward of, man, look, think of where they were four years ago to where they are now. It's just an awesome process. And, and then for us specifically, the guys that we coach together at Urbana, like seeing them as, as fathers and as, as important people in their communities and important people in their churches. And it's, it's just awesome to, to think that we played even a small role in that is it's just so rewarding. Absolutely. I, I think when I think about, you know, lead, teach, and develop, I, I put it into, I've always had an issue with, I've always had an issue with acronyms. Okay. I'm a teacher. Mm -hmm. They're everywhere. Yep. Most of them mean nothing substantial. Right. Most of them are just superficial. Yeah. And so I have an issue with acronyms. Um, what I believe, what I believe in is leadership is one of those things where people will tell you there's a bunch of different ways that you can lead. And that's true. Mm -hmm. But there's only one way that everybody can lead. 
Like everybody has the ability to lead this way, and that's by example. Mm -hmm. Everybody can lead by example. You can have zero talent, and you can work your ass off. Right. And and because you work your ass off, everybody else has to work their ass off because they know that you're going to do it. So as a as a coach, as a coach, I've never been afraid to work. And you know how many hours? I mean, God God bless Dave Tanner, but. <laughs> You know how many hours are associated associated with David Tanner's staff? Like we're going to work, yep. and 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 at the same time, I was not only a you know a coach, but I was the video coordinator, and you had about fifty billion different cuts that you wanted, <laughs> and this is back when we were doing tape to tape cut ups. Yeah. So yeah. like the, uh, the 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 opportunity to work never that never left me. I was always a worker. Yeah. That was always the way that I could lead, whether I was vocal, whether, you know, I, I led because I had the best stats or whatever it might have been. I always had that in my back pocket. Yeah. And so I feel like when it comes to leadership, if you can instill work ethic. And, and I firmly believe it's something that can be instilled. It's not necessarily something that you're born with, although some people have a have a more have an easier disposition to it than others if you can instill work ethic that takes people so much further because that's a leadership quality that everybody can see and it doesn't matter how good you are no doubt no doubt um for, for me like when you talk about you know that teaching obvious i mean i i've always been i've always been a person of the classroom whether that classroom be on a field or in a box, you know, it, with, a, with a board, it doesn't matter. I've always loved to give knowledge and be able to, to give the knowledge in a way that people can accept and apply to their own life. That's always been something that, that I've been a big fan of. And, 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 and like you said, with development, it's the best thing is when it's not the person that you know is good. Mm -hmm. It's not the person that walks in day one, you go, that guy's a stud. And then four years later, they're all American. And you're like, of course. I mean, they were a stud. It's the person you walk in, you go, that guy ever gets on the field, we're in trouble. Exactly. And then three years later, you're like, man, if that guy wasn't on the field, we'd be in trouble. Yeah. And that's the best thing. That's the most exciting part is to watch that development. And you yeah. never know. Like you never know how it's going to end, but you always know there's an opportunity to make somebody better than when they came to you. And that's, that's always been a, a motivational factor for me. So now as coaches, we have an opportunity to uh, mentor. Now, I know that your faith is, is something that's really important to you. And I, I talked to Coach Harrison at Bethel, um, Bethel College. He's a, he, he, you know, it, they're, they're a faith-based college. And so yeah. he's really strong within his faith and he lets it be known um, up front as far as when people come, when, when they recruit students like, hey, listen, this isn't necessarily for everybody yeah. because this is what we believe in and we're going to tell you, and we're gonna, uh, how does your faith play a role in how you present yourself as a coach? Sure. Um, I hope that people can see elements of my faith without me having to say anything is my, is my greatest hope. If people don't see that I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm gonna be a proponent for love and be a proponent for mercy and, and grace and forgiveness and, and all the beauties that come from, from all of the faiths, but if they don't, if they don't see that without me having to preach it, then I have to do a lot of internal reflection. So, um, the last six years I've been teaching and coaching at a, at a high school of faith. So it's a lot easier to, to speak about it, right? Because we're doing things all the time in direct relation to our faith. The position that I just accepted is it's a public school. So, I don't have those same avenues. And in the back of my mind, Gene, there was, there was some, uh, 
I don't know what the right word is, uh, anxiety reservation. I don't know that, okay, am I going to be able to make that, that transition? Cause I'm so used to being able to use my faith, right? Like, and most, not all, but at a lot of college settings, you can still use your faith um, as a platform, even if you're not a faith-based school, right? Like we were able to do that at Urbana. Coach Tanner was awesome with that. Um, in high school, it's a little bit different, right? And, and understandably so. So I was a little bit nervous about that, but, ne- but as I prayed about it and contemplated it, I welcomed it because um, the, the beauty that's in being a Christian and being a Muslim and being uh, Jewish, Hindu, Buddhist, there's beauties, there's principles in that, in the faith to where you don't need to use the verbiage all the time specific to, to the head figure. Right. So, Mm -hmm. um, like we're going to be a team of love. Like we're going to, we're going to show love for each other. The day, the first day Gene that I met my team, I think I, I kind of probably put them in an uncomfortable position because, you know, we're playing, we're, we're a football guys. And there's this, for whatever reason, this mantra behind it of, well, you know, we're the big tough football guys and we don't express emotions and, you know, we don't deal with mental health because we're big and tough, like all these stupid, you know, uh, things that might get linked to it sometimes. And, and I told him, I said, look, I'm going to, I'm going to love you guys. And some of them looked at me kind of weird. And, um, but I said, look, it's important that you guys understand the root of that word. Like to love is to, is to give of oneself. So, we might not like each other all the time, but we're always going to love because love means I'm willing to give of myself to you. And that's one promise that I'll always make to my team is I'm always going to give myself fully to that. And I think that was instilled in me through my faith and, and being a Christian, you know, that's one thing that we see through the lens of Jesus is that he was willing to give of himself to everybody. And it wasn't to the rich. It wasn't to just the poor. It wasn't to, the, the people that understood scripture, it was, it was to everyone. And he brought in the people that you would never expect him to bring in. And I think that's the beauty of it. Um, but that's not limited to just the Christian faith, right? You see that in, in all of the faiths across the world. And for, for me to instill the principles behind it, I think are the most important. And just to touch base on the readings for for uh thursday this week in the church uh, just because i looked ahead and is you know they the the people in the town are are questioning him and and they're like well of all of the commandments like what's the most important and through scripture there's so many right there's over 600 commandments given and, and he says well there's only two that that it's to love god with all your heart mind and soul and to love your neighbor as you love yourself and if we can boil down our world into that, it simplifies it, right? And that's what I love about it. Sometimes people get overwhelmed by the magnitude of the faith. Jesus came and tried to make it like, look, you guys are making this way too hard. It's kind of like we do as coaches sometimes. Sometimes we make it way too tough. Right? Here's, here's your playbook. If, oof, sometimes it could just be, eh, you know, and absolutely. And, and uh, and he says, look, this is, this is what matters. And really that message for our, is, it, it's what we need. It's what we need to be reminded of all the time. A lot of us know it, but we, you need to be reminded of it every day. It's love your neighbor. It's give of yourself to your neighbor like you would give to yourself. And I think that message is the most important. I love the, the sharing on our team that we've experienced already and, and guys just asking me about their faith and, and talking and sharing that dialogue of people that come from different um, spiritual backgrounds. I think it's beautiful. It's, it's that sharing is, is how growth happens and they've been able to teach me things. Hopefully I'll be able to teach them things about it, but it is the, um, it is the guiding force of my life. Like I, I can't hide it. Um, I, I don't want to hide it. So I don't try to, um, it's just, I, I could spend all day in, in the word. I, I, I try to model it the best way I can. I know I'm far from perfect and I make tons of mistakes all the time. Um, but I think it's, it's just, it's too powerful of, it's too much of a part of me to, 
to just stick in the corner, you know, like, I don't know how to do that anymore. And uh, the message that stems from my faith, again, that's most important to me, but it's not limited to the faith. It's, it's for everything is, is this message of choosing love and that love always wins. Like in, when you relate that to the faith, you can, you can nail faith to the cross. You can nail love to the cross and then you can put it in a tomb and it looks like, oh, well, love's finally lost. Like we found a thing that can beat it and it still can't be beaten because three days later it, it walks out and it shows like, look, even in your darkest moments, love's still going to win. And I think that's in a message that's relevant as much today as it was 2000 years ago is look, love's going to win. It, 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 it doesn't know how to lose. Right? You ever had the, those players where like, they just don't know how to lose. Like they're yeah. going to find a way The score more might say that their team lost, but there, there's no way that they're going to lose. It's the same thing with love. It's, it's too strong. It's too powerful. And, and I love it. I, I love sharing that message to anyone that's willing to listen. And I guess that's a lesson that whoever sees this today, hopefully it, it resounds with them. It's that love's always going to win. It doesn't matter how hard you try to defeat it. It's not going to happen. I think the, I think the one thing that you, you mentioned, and, and I think this is what gets lost in kind of the politics of religion, is that at the end of the day, whether you're Christian, whether you're Muslim, whether you're Jewish, whether you're Hindu, whatever you believe in, everyone seems to believe in this universal thing of you have to be a good person. Right. So to whatever extent that good is, we're, we're talking about love. Like we're talking about love as you define it. We're just talking about like being a good person. I had, I had a very interesting conversation with someone once about um, faith and, and about religion. And I said, the two, like faith and religion are, are not universally intertwined because faith is based off of something that you have, you have created in yourself. Religion is something that someone has told you from the outside that this is the way it's done. Right. And your, whatever you believe, you believe that in your heart. That has nothing to do with everybody else. Right. I, I, feel, I feel, and I know a lot of people feel, I feel like my personal relationship is my personal relationship. Absolutely. And it doesn't have to be like your personal relationship for both of us to respect. But you have a personal relationship, you know? And 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 that's the that's the that's the greatest thing about it. So whether you're whether you want to call it God or whether you want to call it Allah, or whether you want to call it, you know, whatever you want to call it, there's there's something that that compels you to be a great person. Yeah. Okay. I've never seen a religion, and I'm not talking about the radical stuff where people do crazy things and, and call it in the name of a religion, which we know is bull. Um, I've never seen a religion teach hate or negativity or right. or, or or not accepting of people. Yeah. I, I, I see tolerance, I see understanding, I see love, I see respect. That's, those are all things that are universal that whether you're someone who believes in a religion or, or you have faith or you're just somebody who believes in being a good person. Yeah. If you believe in being a good person, you're probably going to teach people to be understanding and love. You know what I'm saying? So um, the, way that, the way that manifests itself on a football field is the respect. And the, when you respect and you love somebody, you give more to them. You do yeah. more for them. You become selfless. And we know in football, football is the ultimate selfless game because nothing works without the other people. Like in basketball, you can win a game. Like one person can win a game. We've seen it happen. Sure. Um, somebody gets hot and boom, you know, they carry a team to a victory. That's not the case in football. For as good as Patrick Mahomes is, someone had to catch those passes. Right. Someone had to block right. from in front. You know what I'm saying? So, like, it doesn't matter. Like, Aaron Rodgers, that Aaron Rodgers didn't all of a sudden get worse. You know what I mean? Like, he's, 
he's not dealing with the same level of dude that he was dealing with before and he's having issues. Right. That's, that's a part of the game. And so um, for us being able to um, teach, mentor, and bring our own beliefs into um, the forefront, it's important for us to A, let, let, our, let our kids, let our young men and women grow in the path that they believe is going to be the path for them. Um, I've, I'm very careful to, not, to never pigeonhole someone into a, a, a belief or into a, I, I present them with, these are, th these are your options, these are the things that you have out there, Whichever one rolls for you, at some point, it all gets back to the same place. Yeah, and that and that that road has to be different. So I think as coaches, we can we can be we can we can be we can we can simplify things to make it easier. But just like with not every not every kid you coach needs to go to college. Okay, there used to be a time where. I, I preach college. Yes. It's college, college. It's got to be college, 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 college. And you can go and you can go to college. And and then I started realizing that like, if you're not equipped for college, then college isn't going to do anything except stunt your growth. Right. Like it's not going to make you better. It's actually going to keep you from getting better. Yeah. So then I had to, I had to break down what I was really telling everybody, and it was, you. Everyone should have the college experience. <laughs> but okay. you can have a college experience without going to college. Right. Yeah. Like you can just live in a college town, work during the day while everybody's going to school, and right. live that college life at night. Right. Like that's okay. And so when I started to understand that, I started to get a lot more buy-in from guys who felt like, well, you know, I don't, I'm, I'm going to the military. Like, I want to go right. to the military. And I go, well, you know, that's your choice i prefer if you did that after college but to each their own you know do what you do but there was other people who were just really good at trades like yeah. i'm really good working with cars you know what go make that 30 that 30 40 dollars an hour right now son you don't have to go to college to do that right. now if somewhere down the road you want to go back because you decide man i really like working on cars i wonder if i can work on airplanes right now you have that avenue because we know you can be a lifelong learner. But the idea of steering kids is something that I've had, I've had, you know, revelations over the last well, probably, maybe probably like six or seven years ago, I started going, I can't be, I can't be shifting people just to this one thing when I know that this one thing is probably not for them. You are, you are taking over a school that's an extremely large school, mm -hmm. but in an area with an extremely diverse population. Yep. Many of those kids, college is not a, that's not a thought process for them. Right. How do you handle, how, how are you planning on handling dealing with those different dynamics Sure. Um, when you're mentoring these young men and, and trying to guide them along their path? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I was similar to Eugene in that uh, when I was younger, not all that much younger than now, but I was put college, 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 right? Um, probably because that was the path that I was most familiar with. And then I coached in college for so long that that's just what I knew. Um, but you're right. The the, the, some of the beauty behind the high school that I'm going to work at is they've structured their school day around kids that don't need to be there for from 7.30 to three o'clock, right? If I, can, if I can go work on a trade, I, I can leave school or I can come to school at this time and go work on this and develop that trade, which is incredible. It's awesome that they've structured it that way. Um, and I think my role right now is to present to them what the different avenues are. Cause a lot of the kids, they don't know, right. A lot of kids that I've spoken with so far, like they weren't like, I had one, um, 
player present to me early on that he, he wants to be a plumber. So, but he wasn't sure how to go about it. So we talked about the plumbers union and, and how to get, you know, some different contacts that I can give them from people that I know that have gone that route uh, that I'm friends with or have connections with and just presenting those opportunities to them. And, and within the school dynamic, letting them know all the different things that are out there for them, right? Because the car mechanic, uh, the guy that, that is skilled at working with automobiles, he might, he might want to own his own business one day and learn the business side of it, mm-hmm. right? So presenting to him like, look, okay, well, here's the avenues that you can go. Maybe that's like you said, five years from now, six years from now, after you, you get some more training and, and, and education uh, with the hands-on events. But I think it, the big thing, like anything in life, is showing them the different avenues that are out there and helping them gain those connections and avenues to where they can be like find places that will be successful for them. Because I think you can attest to this as much as anyone being in it for a long time now is, is there, there's so many different schools out there for them to choose and each one is a good fit for somebody different right it's mm-hmm. not a one size fits all thing mm-hmm. same things with the different trades so you just got to present them and you got to show them and you have to help them identify what it is that they want one thing i found with working with with high school age kids is a lot of them just aren't sure what they want yet and that's totally fine right but help it helping to ask helping have them answer questions that can help them see well maybe i don't know like the the thing that i want to study or the trade i want to go to but these are things that are important to me like i'm in a i'm in a school that's this size or i'm this far away from home or whatever it is or i'm going to need to take out this much money to make this happen or no money to make it like just having them answer those questions to help shape help them see where, where the best fit for them is. And I think it's really important. And, and I, think you know, I have a great chance to, to, to really guide those guys since we had that, that experience in the college world where we could say like, look, there, there, there is something for you somewhere, right? No Absolutely. matter how big the school you wanted or how small the school that you want um, or different majors, it's going to be presented somewhere. Um, so we have to help them find it. Yeah, and I think it's I think it's interesting because I know growing up for me, I was not aware that that the world had so many opportunities for post high school education. Right. right. Um, the only thing I really knew were schools that had football programs or basketball programs that I saw on TV. Right. No other school existed for me. <laughs> yeah, right. It's good you know, point. and yep. so like, it, and it's it's amazing. I, I even think about it. I I grew up. My adolescent life was in Tampa, the University of South Florida, which is a pretty damn big university, mm-hmm. just in size and enrollment. Um, was literally like a mile away. Mm-hmm. Never really thought about it. As a university, like as a major university, it never really even clicked to me early on that that's what this thing functions as and, and all of the different dynamics that's there. So being able to present that information, and, and you, you said a mouthful about having them understand what it is that they, that they feel like they need mm-hmm. within their life. I, I, and, and, Here's the crazy part, and this is why I believe so many kids, when it comes to football, fail with their selection because they're not making their college selection based off of need for them and what makes them happy and what makes them feel. They're making their college selection based off popularity and level. Yep. And unfortunately and the timing of that popularity right let me be the first one to get it out there so that people can recognize it absolutely and it's like that that recognition is fleeting you're only popular until you make a decision right. once you make your decision you're no longer popular yep. you see you see these kids amass some of these kids amass 
thousands upon thousands of followers on Instagram and, and, and um, Twitter and, and whatever other platform, right. you know, that they, that, that's out there. I'm on all of them. I get it. But what are you, what are you doing with that amassing of right. people? Like, how is that helping you? Yeah. So the next level for me in this new world is how do we better help them not only navigate that world, but figure out how to make that world work for them. If you're really talking about building a brand and what the hell is your brand? Right. You know, like, don't just tell me, oh, I'm building a brand and, you know, you just retweet people all the time, you know, or you just post something that someone else did because really all your, your brand is to be a sounding board for someone else's brand. Yeah. And that's nothing. Yeah. Um, so like, what are you doing with this, this technology, with this, with this information, with this ability to, to shrink the world? Sure. How are you letting it work in your favor? Why do you still feel the need to go to Alabama or to Clemson okay. or to Georgia or to Ohio State or to Oklahoma because those are the, or to LSU now because those are the sexy names that are always, like why do you feel the need for that? Is it you want to be recognized as being good enough to go to those schools or are you going to do something where you choose a school that really actually provides you with the things that you need in order to be good in life beyond right. the next three, four, five years of your life? And that's something that I'm really, I'm really trying to get more of our young men and women to understand is that your college decision, if you college, your college decision is much more than clout. <laughs> you know, it's much more than clout. It's really about choosing a place that's going to help you develop and become the best you possible. Now, if you think that the best you is football vocational, okay. Right. That I'm fine with that. I'm fine with a football vocational, but let's have a real legitimate conversation then. Right. Because if you're football vocational, if you think that your stratosphere is heading towards NFL, then that means that you can go wherever you want to go. Right. Everybody wants you. Right. Like, Jadavion Clowney was going to the NFL if he went to Albright. Yep, absolutely. You know what I'm saying? Like, you, like they're going to come and get a six foot six. Yeah. 280 pound dude running a 4440 if he's at Albright. By the way, he would have probably had 35, 40 sacks a season. Like, right. they're going to come and find you. So, why not use that power that you have? It's the only time that you have power. You don't even have power when you go to the NFL. The only time you really have power is when you make your college decision. And if you're fortunate enough to reach a new contract in the NFL. It's the only time you're going to have power within that, within the sport. Right. Why not use it to put yourself in the better, in the best position mentally, physically, spiritually, like don't be afraid of your faith right. because you know, it's going to get, it, you're going to get shunned at, at Florida state. Right. <laughs> Just don't go to Florida state. Yeah, I'm a Florida state fan. But if that's how you feel, don't go there. Right. And if you think that, you know, if you think that, man, I really love Clemson, but Dabo, you be doing a little bit too much talking about, talking about God and Jesus, and I don't really see him sticking up for my people, then don't go to Clemson. Right. Don't just go there because it's Clemson. Right. Go there because it's going to help you become the best you that you can possibly be. And when you are one, when you are that one percent, when you're that person that all you have to do is to just continue to grow, you don't get that anywhere. I don't know a coach in America that's not going to bust their ass to get you to that next level. And that's NAI Division Three, Division Two, NCCAA, Junior College, 
they're yes. all going to try their best to get you to the level that you want to be at if you're that level of talent. No doubt. And I think, Gene, the, um, to reflect back on something you were talking about with um, the kids and their, and their brand, um, here's one uh, advice that I try to give to anyone that will listen is that that concept of your brand it's important right but if it's if it only reflects upon you if it's only about yourself you're going to make a mistake right all of us are going to make a mistake and then that brand gets tarnished because and, and and people are waiting for that mistake from most people so that they can bring your brand down because for some reason they think that brings their brand up right if if your brand is about the best like getting the best out of yourself but it also is built upon investing in others then when you make that mistake the the light that you gave to all those others will help shine over that mistake right so i talk to our i talk to the kids that i get to teach and the kids that i get to coach about the difference between being nice and the and being actively kind. I think that's I, I think that's something that a lot of people, particularly of the white race, are missing right now. That they get defensive when well well I'm nice. Like I'm not I'm not I'm not a racist towards Gene. Okay, okay, well I think you'd probably agree, Gene. Ninety eight percent of the people on the planet are quote unquote nice. Right? Like they don't want to see harm inflicted on anybody, but there's a difference between being nice and then being actively kind. And mm -hmm. to me, the definition of being actively kind is actively searching out the need of another person and then doing whatever you can to meet that need. Right. So if, if African Americans right now are feeling like needs are not being met because they aren't being met, and I don't know if this correlation will make sense to everybody, but I do a lot of work with uh, youth that are disabled, right? When, when someone walks into a, a hospital and sees a child that's disabled, they, they can easily recognize the need that that kid has, right? And then they want to do things to help meet it. But for some reason, there's so many people right now that are seeing the African-American uh, group in our country and not seeing the need that they have, like the need to be heard, the need to be treated fairly, the need to be respected and, and to feel like they're loved, that needs not being met and that there's a difference. So if I only go around working on my personal brand or I only go around being quote unquote nice, the second I slip, it, I, I'm in trouble, right? My brand is... Whoosh, but if my brand is built around you, it's built around every, every other person that, I, that God sends my way and I can invest in them and I can give myself to them, that's my brand, right? My brand is reflected in so that like I can feel good, Gene, when, when you do good, right? Because I gave myself to you. You gave yourself to me. You can feel good when I accomplish things. You can feel good when your players accomplish things because you gave yourself to them. If it's just about you. Like I said, like we're all imperfect. We're all going to make mistakes, and then people are going to are harping on that. But I, you know, when you see certain people that we all know in the world make mistakes, but you know that they've spent so much of their life giving to others, there's that. Oh, okay. Well, like we got to cut them a little bit of slack here. Like, yeah, he made this mistake, but look at all that he or she's done before yeah. enough of this. And I think that's important. I think that's really a big part of what we're missing right now. Is is just it's not just well i'm nice or i'm not i'm not adding to the problem but really you are because you're not you're not searching out that need and trying to help meet it well i, I think i think the what we're talking about is being selfless you know mm -hmm. um and, and that's a that's the thing what i have found in this since since you you brought it to there like what i found in this situation um and i have been a lot of circles where i grew up i grew up around almost all black people then i went to a high school 
that was predominantly white. Okay. I made friends. Um, I, I feel like there were things that I learned going to that predominantly white school that helped me going beyond. There's things that I learned growing up around a bunch of black people that helped me. What I what I learned, I mean what I what I figured out is this the the reason why white people have so many have so many issues with what they should do is because they take a stance of reaction. Right. That's the problem. Right. But the reaction comes after you see what we've already enacted. Right. And so it's like, oh my gosh, it's terrible that this, this man was killed. But there were five other men killed, women killed. Like, like just think about the idea that there's out, like, like, like how much this, 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 this last case is blown up. So it's worse that the police killed this man who was like who could not harm them with his hands behind his back. But where was the outrage for a man jogging who got gunned down in the street by two random dudes who considered themselves to be policing the area? Right. That was met with, well, what did he do? Well, why was he in the neighborhood? Right. Why was he looking in a structure being built? We all look in structures being built. If I'm running along the street and I see a house that's being built, I will jog up to it. Yeah. Oh, this is going to be nice. Yeah. And keep on jogging. I'm not doing that anymore. Apparently, that's like cause to get shot and killed. And so a lot of black people, and, and, and I don't want you to feel as if you have to go as far as to say African-American, because we don't identify with that. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like that's not that's not how all of us identify. If when people say and when and, and I know that there's no malice meant when you say it. Yeah. But we, but when we hear people, especially white people, say African American, we feel like is that what you would normally say? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And, and so that's that's how we look at it. And so I have gotten a lot of phone calls from um, people that I think are some awesome people, white people who are, are just really good people. And I appreciate all of those phone calls. I just wonder where those phone calls were yeah. before the world started burning. Right. Like before, before, before Minnesota started burning, where were those phone calls of, hey, this is awful. Even if you felt it right. and you didn't reach out, Okay, now is the time where we where we need to look at things, and it can no longer just be a man. I feel that it's I have to do something, and for us as coaches, it's easy. We have we have anywhere between forty and a hundred plus young men that we get to affect every single year, and I take that. I'm so thankful. I'm so thankful that I get an opportunity to affect that in young men on a year in, year out basis. That I get a chance that hopefully we continue to, to, to crank out the Tim Watsons of the world and, and, and crank out the, 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 um, the, the slates of the worlds and the sticks of the worlds. You know what I'm saying? Like those, these, these young men and the, and the Billy Nichols of the worlds. Like, come on. Like these are fantastic young men, black, white, mixed race, everybody. I, I could go on and on. These are guys who are doing great things with their life. And it's not about how much money they make. It's not about, but they understand that we gotta be better. Yeah. And they understand how to comport themselves in these matters to be examples rather than to be pawns. Right. And and that's the thing where I, I just go, 
to all of my white friends and or or to just white people in general like like we appreciate the hey i just want to make sure you're okay but if you're texting me i'm okay you know what i'm saying yeah. like this isn't new like people were acting as if like we would be de i i am i am my hurt comes from the fact that this is not new right you know i'm not outraged at what happened i'm outraged that this continues to happen right and there's a difference there and i think if we can start to relay that message to our young men to where they might just for a split second um i'm you know i, I have a team full of a bunch of black kids and a handful of white kids. Just for a split second, I want that white kid when he grows up and he's in a situation where somebody might be in, insensitive to just think back to those 50, 60 other black brothers that he had and go, hey man, that's not gonna roll here. Yeah. You know, my you know, one of my best friends is a white man, and I love him to death, Jeff Dittman. He's a great, he's a great man. I know that if some if somebody says something inappropriate in front of him, I don't have to be in the room for him to check. Me. And that's really where we need to get to. We need to get to the point where white people are checking other white people when there are no black people around. Absolutely. And I think if we can get to that point, then 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 the sky's the limit for what we can do. And that, that's part of the, um, in the three words that you gave when talking about teaching about that should be the standard that we hold everybody to, right? Like clearly set that as this is, this is where we need to be. So let's hold each other to it, right? If, when there is no one out, when there is, when there isn't a black man or woman in the room, we still say, no, that, that's wrong and hold them to it. That's holding them to that standard. I think that's important. Absolutely. The, I'm going to get you out of here on this. What do you feel like are, are going to be your emotions the first time you get to run onto a field with your team? Um, yeah, it's a great question. Um, I don't, I don't, uh, I think it'll, it will, they'll, Unquestionably, I think leading up to the game, there'll be like a lot of reflection on all the different people that helped me get to that point. Um, but that being said, um, I'm fairly confident that when it comes to that moment, my focus won't be on myself. It's going to be on the team. It's going to be on the, the community and the school and and how I just, I want to do the best I can to represent it the way it deserves to be represented, you know? And, um, but that I, I have recently thought about, um, because the interesting thing, Gene, is my first game is against the school that I've been coaching at the last six years. So all the kids that I helped bring to that school that I've been teaching, that I've been coaching, the head coach of the school, who's one of my best friends, he's the godfather of my son, uh, just two months ago, like wow. we're going against each other. Right. So my first game's a little bit different. Um, I think there's going to be a lot of just reflection about all those guys I see on the other side um, and the coaching staff that's been so good to me. Um, it, that that's going to, there's going to be a lot of thought and reflection about them and, and then just um, feeling the responsibility of leading those guys, making sure that, you know, like that I feel good about who they are and what our team is way before we get to the, the execution of the plays. Like when we walk out, when we walk on the field, I want to feel good about who we are when we're walking on there. Um, and making sure that I don't lose sight of the fact of um, the scoreboard tells one part of the story and it is an important part, but it's not the only part of the story. Like we still got to feel good about the things that we did leading up to that time and and, uh, and again, and feeling good about investing in each other. If we can look at each other through the lens of love that we, we invested ourselves in one another, then 
we'll feel good. We'll run out there with confidence and we'll, we'll have some fun. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, I, I really do appreciate it. Coach Barr. Um, My pleasure. you know, really thank you for joining us, being open, um, being willing to share and, and, and talk about, you know, um, your journey, your faith and how that plays into, um, you know, what you do as a coach. I feel like so many times people are afraid to be themselves for fear that it might turn yep. some people off. And so I've gotten over that long time ago. I'm a, I'm a different cat. Like, it is what it is for me. Um, but it's refreshing to see other people be willing to, like, just fully embrace who they are and, and, and what, what makes them go, what makes them want to get up in the morning. And so I really do appreciate um, that from you. Thanks. If you would, um, you know, share, share with everybody your social media. Um, does, does the team have a social, any social um, media? I'm, I'm, the, I'm the worst person to ask that question. I know you I'm are. Sorry. I got to get you into I'm the first get savvy. Um, But the school that I'm coaching at right now is Upper Darby High School. We're located in Drexel Hill, Pennsylvania. Um, we're a new staff, so – like a lot of there'll be like some turnover, I guess, in like our social media stuff and all those things. But um, but we are a huddle school. So anybody that's a that's a coach that checks us out that wants to see some stuff on huddle from our guys from years previous, they can see that on there. Um, and if if you look up Upper Darby High School, you'll see all the amazing things that the students at our school do. Um, our arts program at our school is one of if not the best in the state like the kids just do unbelievable things and then we have like you mentioned before we're a large school so we do most uh most sports are represented at our high school so um and the kids are super successful at at all of them which will be fun so uh we play in a really competitive league um, and then our out of, we play two out of conference games this year if we get to play a full schedule. And like I've mentioned, our first one is against uh, the school that I've been working at the last six years, which is uh, Monsignor Bonner, Archbishop Prendergast uh, Catholic High School. Um, they used to be two separate schools. There used to be a boys' school, which was Bonner, and a girls' school, which was Prendy. The schools merged, uh, uh, I guess it's about seven years, six or seven years ago now. Um, so it's just, it's good football. There's good football everywhere in the country and in this part of Pennsylvania, there's, there's great football too. So looking forward to the season. Hopefully we get to, um, you know, to compete and, uh, and have some fun. Well, you know, Coach Barr, again, I appreciate you joining us. We've got we to gotta get you on some social, you know, yeah. media. We've got right. to get you tw at least a Twitter, you know, up and rolling. I had, I, I have a Twitter account, but I don't use it the way most people use it, right? It's just a, it's just an information gathering system for me. Absolutely. I have a Facebook you get you to have it as a information giving. I know. Account. I have a Facebook page and I use it as the same means. It's to gather information on my friends and their families and their kids. And if, if my wife never, tagged me in anything on Facebook, my page would look like it did in 2012. I think that's the last time I made a post. Well, um, thank God for your wife. Thank, exactly. thank God for her. You know. People that are friends with me actually know what my kids look like because she tags me on it. Um, and I don't have Instagram, I don't have Snapchat or anything else that, that's out there. I wouldn't even know what, what to do with that stuff. Um, whether that's right, wrong, or indifferent, I don't know. It's just has never really been my thing. And um, No. No, it's not wrong, but I, I would say you definitely want to make sure you, you know, get on that, get that Twitter account popping. If for no other reason than just to give, um, you know, anxious recruiters an opportunity to right. be able to to get a hold of you a lot quicker if yeah. they don't have your phone number or something. Quick, like that. Uh, quick shout out to our strength coach, our running back guy, our running back DB coaches, Cyrus Barley. He's, he's amazing with social media, so I have all the confidence in the world that. <laughs> he will run it very efficiently and be very effective. Whereas I would fumble that exchange. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, coach, coach Barley, I think it's, um, his social media is at lockdown underscore side. And okay. so, um, 
you know, definitely keep a hold. And I've, I've seen Coach Barley. He's like, he's pretty, he's pretty plugged in yeah. to social media. So, um, you know, if you follow at lockdown underscore Cy, um, he, he'll make sure that you are um, in tune with what they're doing up there at Upper Derby. So, cool. again, Coach, I appreciate it. Um, Thank you. it let's fun. make sure we, we, we stay in contact. Good. You know, link up and, and we got to catch a game or something soon. I got to come and see the wife and kids. Right. And, and we'll, cool. you know, we'll do something. You'd love it. I would love that. Thanks for having me on, man. It's been great. I really enjoy Always get a lot out of talking to you. So thanks for all you've done for kids everywhere and, and, and for the development of the game. It's, it's awesome to see. So good luck to your season as well. Good luck to your program. And, Thank you. Um, and I look forward to uh, seeing all the successes you guys enjoy too. Absolutely. I appreciate it, Coach. Thank you again for quarantine coaching conversations. I've been Coach Gene Clemens. Make sure that you follow me at all social media platforms at Gene Clemens. Make sure you subscribe to the YouTube channel, Coach Gene Clemens. Like this video, share it. These are great conversations because we're talking about things that go well beyond football, but really football has been able to, you know, attach these lessons and make it really easy for our young men and young women who are involved with the program. So, you know, make sure that you're loving each other out there, like Coach Barr said, um, because that is – that, that's, that's paramount to where we are right now. We're in the situation we're in right now because people refuse to just love the other person, love thy neighbor. And so if we, can, if we can get to that point, a lot of this other stuff goes away. And um, a lot of the racism, a lot of, the, a lot of the, 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 the issues that we deal with as far as class, as far as sex, all that goes away. We just love each other more. And so um, definitely take that message to heart. Um, and it's a message that matters regardless of what your religion is. And so it's been a great, a great conversation with Coach Barr. Um, for quarantine coaching conversation, I'm coaching Clinton.